Uh, he is going to talk about the tips and tricks insertion of a ventricular catheter. Please go ahead. Okay, thanks. Firstly, uh, Asim, thank you so much, Naren, and all your effort in putting together what, what really turned out to be a, a really informative and and, and uh, incredibly interesting workshop. So I'm I'm going to bring up the tail end with sort of a bit more of the nuts and bolts and you know clinically relevant stuff. So just um, things that I actually while I put this talk together, realized I learned more about it than I I, I thought I would. So <clears throat> some of the fundamental principles I think for me that I apply you know to myself and and in the unit as well is planning is is absolutely essential. And by planning I mean measuring on the it's usually a CT scan for these cases for hydrocephalus but you know if the MRI scans depending on what the, the etiology is you have to mark plan your entry point plan the best trajectory measure your depth or your <clears throat> the, the, the length of your catheter if navigation is being used which is increasingly frequently I mean this is usually in the core in the context of smaller ventricles I've added that point for medical legal relevance I think it's going to be quite an important discussion point and again at the end I'll bring that up Positioning of the patient is fundamental. <clears throat> so uh, getting the head turned across, so your, 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 your uh, insertion of the catheter position is more from caudal downwards rather than, than, than parallel to the ground or upwards. So I think all those things make a big, big, big difference. I've listed some of the standard landmarks and in the course of the talk, you'll see, I'll just try and revise some of them. I think that's quite important. And I think for me, more important than the actual landmarks are that these reference points mostly need to be adjusted, specifically in children, depending on the size of the head, the shape of the head, you know, whichever point you use as a reference, but you almost always need to modify it slightly, whether it's just by a few millimeters or, you know, more, one, one needs to bear that in mind. Again, fundamental principles is once you've done that, the burr hole and the entry, um, the style at advancement, you know, generally the way I was taught and the way I teach our registrars is five centimeters with the stilette, and then you feed the rest in on soft feedback. Once you get CSF uh, coming back, I think that haptic feedback or the, the 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 pop that one feels is fairly consistent. I have become aware now that some people advance the catheter without the stilette. Again, an interesting discussion point. It's you know I struggle with that a little bit because I think you know where the catheter ends up if you don't have the stilette at least to five centimeters, it's just you know anyone's guess. Uh, how one connects the ventricular end to the distal end? These catheters and the the valves always have some form of torque or memory of the catheter. And if you tunnel slightly laterally, no matter how accurately you place the catheter it always will get pulled medially or laterally depending on how you tunnel so that also needs to be it needs to be um, i think planned carefully and then minimize basic principle is when you implant these catheters minimize you know the, the, the ventricular catheter manipulation once it's in you know it must be it must be kept then if you move it around you know that, that's that's just always a bad thing so i've inclu included here an interesting picture that i found and somebody posted on linkedin a, a, a neurosurgeon who's uh, says she's an ambidextrous neurosurgeon that's a, a claim to fame. I would argue that if you look at the merits of that, you know, how often we use both hands is 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 relatively different from surgeon to surgeon, but the context and the sort of dexterity with which you use it, I suppose, suppose defines true surgical ambidexterity. And I think as neurosurgeons, we should be a lot more comfortable in both hand, with both hands than we should. And then just to show the variation, you know, parietal approaches, I, I frown upon them. It'll be interesting to see what some of the other senior panel members you know, prefer or suggest to their their trainees. With in 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 my unit, it's almost always occipital or frontal. I I found quite a bit on the the parietal approach. Uh, some of these points, then, like I said, so Fraser's point, I think fairly standard. Uh, you know, you measure six centimeters from the inion, then three to four centimeters laterally. I think we, I've always, I don't know if I should, maybe I should just go back there. Sorry, this is one thing I forgot to mention. I almost always place this cardiac electrode in the center, just over the glabella. Doesn't matter whether we're using navigation or not under the drapes. That's always my go-to reference point. And I work sort of uh, relative to the medial canthus, depending on that. I think Fraser's point is a fairly standard issue. Keen and dandies, I've moved away, like I said, um, from these sort of parietal holes, but very often, more often than we'd like, we often get patients referred from you know, other parts of the, of the country for whatever reason. And, you know, these shunts are placed there. And as much as I frowned upon them, there was a patient who had a shunt placed 10 years ago, and it was still functioning. 
you know, placed in, in pretty much Keynes' point. So as much as one argues this, you've got to be you know, cognizant of the fact that there is no absolute uh, uh, sort of correct way of doing it. I think most of us just developed in some ways along the lines that we've been taught it and maybe minor variations of that. Dandy's point I've left here for historical reference. I think in a lot of the, a lot of the, the kind of publications shown that the, the risk of injuring the, the transfer sinus was quite high. So the, hence the elevation, uh, you know, above uh, the Indian. Sanchez's point is something I picked up as I was, you know, looking through some of the literature for this talk. I think it's ma mainly aimed at placing your catheter into the temporal lobe. If you look at how things are manipulated slightly inferiorly, the reference points are fairly standard. So 5.6, quite specific, and then 2.7 millimeters centimeters off the midline. And the way you aim basically is to get that catheter into the into the temporal horn, which is something you know I, I tend to get my my registrars to try and avoid. But should you need to do it, this is this is apparently. The reference technique. Cochers, if you were looking at placing external ventricular drains or frontal frontal shunts, I think is a fairly standard junior level registrar uh, uh, position. And I'll show some of the you know the advances or the adjuncts that have been advocated both for frontal and and occipital placement. So other described interesting points that I've picked up as well. Anteriorly, there's Kaufman's point, and this is really you know uh, I think some of it historically, but in 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 cases where you're performing you know frontal access skull base surgery, and you know there, there, there's a su su suggestion of of raising ICP or hydrocephalus and you're needing to puncture the ventricle, then these are the trajectories and the points you'd use. F various other points, you'll see your pains, yuns, and, and, and parks. Manovsky's point is again something quite interesting. I mean, increasingly we're trying to use minimally invasive transorbital and supraorbital approaches, so that's quite useful to bear in mind. And then the um, TUPS point, which is you know really aimed at, at transorbital excess, is an absolute emergency, but we're worth kind of being familiar with. I think most of us wouldn't really get to use it in our in our average careers, but just nice to know. Um, so then the issue of when we're placing these shunts, you know, frontal versus occipital, I think is a is always going to be a discussion point. And I would argue that at the end of the day, it boils down to kind of institutional memory, what you've been taught and, you know, what you're comfortable with. Um, the study by, by Kessel and his team showed that <clears throat> there is no ideal target within the ventricle. And during the course of the study, what they actually found was that um, the entry point was probably more useful than the final point that the shunt, you know, as long as it was placed in CSF, the entry point appeared to have, have more of a value, which is an interesting discussion point. Uh, for for slit-like ventricles, the study on the left here showed that, you know, uh, with electromagnetic guidance, the parieto-occipital placement is equivalent, if not slightly better, when placing the ventricular catheter. And other advantages that they pointed out were things like it's more convenient for the valve place, and that makes sense because you're tucking it under more muscle, thicker scalp posteriorly, so the hair goes over it. Fewer incisions, I'm assuming they mean that they would make an additional incision when tunneling. I, I wasn't quite sure what that meant. Uh, easier tunneling, you could argue that I, either way, depending how you uh, position the patient, you know, the tunneling from an occipital burr hole can be complicated if you don't do it correctly. Uh, frontally, you know, behind the ear always. But, you know, I, I think that's a fair point. The tunneling is probably the easier. And the other benefit that they list there is less hair shaving, which I suppose is relative to how much hair you started off with in the first place. Okay, so the modern neurosurgery theater is, a, again, I, you know, th this this for me becomes increasingly complex. Every time I show the slide, there's something else. But in that context, what I wanted to select out were the adjuncts that, that that you know, would basically fall into this. more, more not, not so much tips and tricks, but sort of recommendations and maybe even to some extent guidance guidelines. And these, there's some nice articles sub summarizing these. If you look at them, they fall into sort of roughly four or five broad categories, so navigation guidance, and that falls into you know, our electromagnetic or optic navigation guidance. Stereotactic tools, and there have been some interesting ones developed. Uh, endoscope assisted, I'm going to touch on the relevance of that, something we've spent quite a bit of time driving the ultrasound guidance, the sort of pros and cons of that, and some of the more interesting recent uh, advances and techniques which have been described, some which I wasn't aware of myself before this talk. All right, so navigation, I think, has found its way on neural navigation as an absolute fundamental. I think there are very few centers anywhere in the world now that are not using navigation routinely. And you can argue that it may be to some extent because of the medical legal environment in those particular countries, but also I think we've become a lot more comfortable with the fact that we use navigation assistance. The argument against that, which is 
it's a bit of a tough one, I suppose, that 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 you know our trainees are becoming less and less familiar with the basic um, anatomical landmarks, and you know how those were used. But I'll show a study now uh, as we go along that actually suggests that using those may be just as good, if not better. So I, I think you know a, as we progress, navigation and now robotic assisted navigation, you know, I think that advances advances more and more. So you know it's 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 here to stay, and particularly in terms of of of, of ventricular catheter placements, I think is is an absolute fundamental too. So, you know, the, 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 there are a number of studies that have, that have looked at this, but this review and meta-analysis basically shows that the current literature limited to case series shows the heterogeneity in methodology and reporting, but largely the navigation is useful for the accurate placement of, of, of ventricular catheters, particularly, obviously, in the more complex cases. So I've listed th this to show that even though this talk is focused more on, you know, small ventricles and normal morphology, the context of using uh, a neural navigation or electromagnetic navigation is probably more relevant in the more complicated cases. So your multi-loculated hydrocephalus of really small ventricles. Image guidance comes in several forms, and I'll unpack that as we go along. And then advancing on this neural navigation uh, uh, principle is the combination of neural navigation with real-time imaging. And the group in Israel combined it with intraoperative MRI. Small group of patients, infants, but they found it useful. They found it correct for this kind of documented brain shift. You know, the biggest problem with navigation is it's all preoperative uh, imaging. So as soon as you get your catheter into the ventricle or cyst or whatever it is you're cannulating, the whole system changes and your navigation is then virtually completely unreliable. Uh, so summarizing that, this is a British study, and they looked at the utility of image-guided ventriculostomies. They analyzed contemporary practice, practice in the United Kingdom and Ireland. Fairly large number of patients, and uh, <clears throat> they found that around 66 of these ventricular catheters were optimally placed. And they had fairly robust criteria, so they used you know, grading and classification systems for that. Around about 20% of these were placed under navigation guidance. And they found that in this group, there was no improvement in the measured uh, catheter position or catheter blockage rate, which is important because we always use catheter position as a proxy for its its likelihood to block. Uh, so image guidance ventricular catheter placement in, the, in this study uh, didn't result in optimal catheter of the placement or lower catheter blockage rate. So what they concluded there is the point I was making earlier, that they encouraged improved training within uh, registrars and trainees, uh, you know, to, to, to kind of toughen up their skills around anatomical landmarks to improve the, the technique for placement of these catheters and ultimately improve results in case of disturbed anatomy and smaller ventricles. So they they betted quite hardly, sorry, quite quite heavily in favor of you know using the, the freehand non-navigated technique. So a slight sort of variant of navigation, the stereotactic guidance, which is <clears throat> different from the electromagnetic and the optic systems that we use. These are actual physical catheter guides which have been developed. They largely follow the same principle, <clears throat> the, tri the tripod guard, tripod guide. Uh, there's a fair amount written about that. There's also the, 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 the Tomale guide, which was part of this Gevka study, which has been advanced to some extent, and I'll show to a smartphone application, which really shows the trajectory of this. You know, we use these basic things, and as, as technology advances and our thinking and our insight becomes deeper and deeper, you know, uh, developing uh, uh, mobile apps for integrating these sorts of things becomes very much the standard of care. Using these guidance, the, there was a conclusion that the gu guided ventricular catheter application definitely proved to be safe and simple. The primary endpoint showed there was no really significant in the optimal catheter placement among the groups, and they suggested longer-term follow-up. It's interesting to note there's really only one study looking at all of these where there was a significant difference between whatever the, the, the tested method was compared to the controlled freehand technique. Um, endoscopy assisted uh, ventricular catheter placement again you know something I think a lot of us have at some point used I'll just play this video in the background to show it's an old video it comes from some of the uh, work we've done still at Red Cross but the conclusions around this <clears throat> Suggests that endoscopic ins uh, insertion or endoscopic guidance assisted um, insertion of the um, so I just want to move that on there um, of the initial shunts, uh, you know, did not reduce the incidence of shunt failure. So effectively, even though you place these, and I showed a video specifically, you know, of complex hydrocephalus, not just placing a catheter into a ventricle, but one that had been fenestrated. And I think in these cases, the argument for endoscopic guidance or ultrasound or whatever guidance one wants to use is a lot stronger. 
But this study, again, run by John Castle and the endoscopic shunt insertion trial participants, showed there was a distinct lack of benefit when one placed these catheters endoscopically. And they had very clear criteria that were used to measure the outcome. However, this study using something called the shunt scope uh, by, by Carl Stortz, a study from Germany, showed that they considered it to be a very valuable addition to standard surgical tools in treating specifically pediatric hydrocephalus, but the context of small ventricles was, was maintained, or at least abnormal anatomy, and they found uh, high rates of correct catheter placement. So when they compared it to their standard, and this was 65 procedures, they found that it did, uh, it did confer benefit that they found significant in this particular study. So ultrasound guidance, I'll touch on this, you know, there, there are some necessities one needs to have, depending on the context, you know, these are not all relevant for, for ventricular catheter placement, but you need to be at least familiar with some of the principles. There has been touted many times as an ideal navigation technique. This is a video I like to show a kitty that we ended up shunting. I think we all agree those are fairly small ventricles. Um, and this is really the only real time you can see in the sagittal plane, we have we can track the catheter placement in real time. I thought we did a fairly good job, but as I get to the foramen, you can just flip the catheter around into a coronal plane. And you can see in real time, they were quite a bit more lateral than I had anticipated. The benefit there is you can correct it immediately, you know, and in real time, and you know more or less what to expect with your follow-up scan. The various types of probes, the burr hole probe, which some companies now have dedicated specifically for catheter placement. The benefit being that you don't need to, in theory, increase the size of your of your burr hole and their little guides. As a company, there's a guide specifically in the or a groove in the catheter you can see over there, which allows you to place it. If you need to do, you know, or widen your burr hole, you can see this is the BK probe, which suggests that you might need to widen your burr hole slightly. It's something I, I don't do routinely, and probably because of most of the kids that we treated had an open anterior fontanelle, so we could just uh, do the ultrasound through the open anterior fontanelle. Again, there would be an interesting discussion point just to see how different people, you know, do them. Just an idea of what our setup is. So ergonomics are incredibly important. This is the case I'm showing, probably not relevant so much to, to this talk, but for complex hydrocephalus, where we use ultrasound to guide the endoscope. Scope. But the bottom line is it needs to be in line of sight. It needs to be part of your ergonomic workflow just to show the quality of the images, not limited to normal sort of simple hydrocephalus, but complex hydrocephalus. We then evaluated or at least did a correlation study comparing ultrasound measurements with CT scans, found a pretty good correlation between the two. We used this criteria described by Hayhurst, similar study to that done by the group in Tübingen. And they came up with very strong recommendations. They, you know, they concluded by saying that ultrasound guided ventricular catheter placement should become standard of care in VP shunt surgery. Again, that's arguable. It depends on, I suppose, the level of expertise. It depends on the type of machine you have and very much to the type of experience that you have. The Hydrocephalus Research Network, again, evaluated this fairly big cohort four hydrocephalus research network centers, 11 ultrasound surgeons. They divided them into, uh, you know, experience, what they call experience and novice, but really published just the experience of the, of uh, the, 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 um, um, experience, sorry, of the of the experienced surgeons and compared it to conventional surgeons. And they showed a 30, that, that, sorry, 59% uh, had what was called an accurate location. Again, this was quantitatively uh, measured. In the conventional surgery, surgery group, they had 49% accurate location. But when these were tested, there was no real statistical significance. What they did found, find comes back to the point I made earlier. It's not just where your tip ends up in the ventricle, but the trajectory and the entry point and how you connect it to the distal catheter, which will eventually lead to this, what they demonstrated in the study, migration of the catheter from the original position that they used the ultrasound for. So by the time they did the follow-up CT scan, the catheter position had moved significantly. If you compare the one-year shunt survival rate in both of them, they're fairly, fa fairly comparable. So what that suggests is even though the accuracy was a, you know, a little better in this than that, it didn't impact on the overall shunt survival rate. And we've got to bear in mind that even though this talk is geared mostly at ventricular catheter placement, shunts, like I'll show at the end, are more than just the ventricular catheter placement. So your, your institutional protocol or guideline or whatever you follow needs to follow a very clear protocol and that 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 has been published you know extensively so how the distal catheter is placed is just as important
So to summarize those, you know, adjuncts, I think the relevance are best subject, uh, best summarized by the, the HCRN uh, review, and this was published a while back, but still I think as relevant as 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 it was then. And their conclusions, looking at endoscopic guidance, ultrasound guidance, as well as computer assisted, is that the recommendation at best was it was level one with a high degree of clinical certainty uh, that that there's insufficient uh, evidence for endoscopic guidance for ultrasound assisted placement. They found it to be an option and for EM navigation, also an option. So again, the jury is very much still hung on this, but I think in an era of high uh, medical legal sensitivity, most of us defer to this kind of defensive medicine approach and would use it either because we're really comfortable with it and we find benefit, but also because we find, you know, we know it's it's kind of medical legally almost a prerequisite in some in some countries. Recent innovations, I'm going to touch on things like robotic assistance, interoperative fluoroscopy, smartphone assistance, and then the simulation uh, training models. So robotic assistance, like we can, you know, we, we this is completely expected if you look at the dramatic inflection and an upsurge in the in the invasion really of artificial intelligence and mathematical modeling and i think in neurosurgery probably more than any other speciality at the moment we were we witnessing that inflection this is a british study like or at least a study published in the british journal of neurosurgery I think it was a Japanese group or combined Asian group that showed uh, this is the technique that they use. I mean, oddly, I found in this particular case, the patient was a position exactly like this, but they revised a parietal catheter. You can see there's the arm coming through, holding the catheter in this purpose designed stilet, and they actually act entering the, the ventricle with the patient looking upwards like that, which seemed quite awkward to me, but clearly, you know, because they were using the robotic arm, that seemed to be a reasonable thing to do. But they found it to be safe and reliable. The highlighted advantages that were described were things like it should be used, especially where previous attempts and methods failed. So as a sort of, you know, last resort or end of the road resort, but, you know, they could place the, bed, the, the catheter quite, quite accurately into uh, small ventricles. Interoperative fluorosity I mean, I knew I knew there was something, but I never never really looked at it aggressively until now. And there's more a number of studies that publish this, and I think this is really centers that have you know the hybrid theater that are doing a fair amount of endovascular work, where the neurosurgeon does this work. Particularly, may find this useful. But they also fairly decent number of patients, 104, 57 in the fluoroscopy group, 47 control, and that was what they demonstrated. So accurate placement at 79% under fluoroscopic guidance and about 50% uh, you know, in the control group. So they found this to be easy to perform, reliable. They described that it that they could correct malposition catheters as well, and they found that it decreased the early revision rate. And when they compared these, this is the one study that demonstrated um, significant statistical difference between the two groups. So interesting, but I'd like to hear whether some of our, our kind of senior uh, discussants and, and participants, you know, are familiar with it or used it. I only found a few descriptions, but certainly they, they make a strong case for it. Uh, smart smartphone assisted ventricular catheter placements. I can see here there's an app that you would use that needs to be calibrated for the cranium. They have the scans loaded, almost like a little compass that allows you to correct for curvature of the head. Um, then initially it was used together with, a, you know, with one of those uh, stereotactic devices I'd shown. But the advances now suggest that using the app alone, you're able to place this catheter under guidance. And you know, the publication, at least this one here, suggests that these medical app apps will grow into very strong clinical guiding instruments. The smartphone assisted adjustment of the lateral angle apparently allows reliable ventricular catheter placement with most of the correction needing to be done in a coronal plane. Uh, simulation training, and depending on which center you're at, this has been a big driver. In our center, we've done a lot of lot of kind of you know development in this simulation training. Whether that the kind of virtual or augmented reality type of placement, or whether models are being built for simulation training, this is a 3D augmented reality. You know, I think whichever system you use, if your simulation training system is kind of based on on good uh, technology and science, it, you can it, you can't go wrong. Uh, with this as a fundamental part of your of your trainee uh, uh, regimen. To summarize, then I think accurate placement of ventricular catheter has been, is, and always will be one of the holy grails of neurosurgery. We've got to remember that a comprehensive institutional protocol for VPS placement is most important. So proximal and distal catheter placement, you need to look at things like positioning, tunneling, gloving, antibiotics, when you start, how many people in theater. I think that's probably more important than how the actual catheter is placed. 
but you know at least at the context of this talk was focused specifically on catheter placement there are several novel techniques described i think the relevance of these are very contextual very institutional geographical i think they may be more relevant in some parts of the world than others so what you take home from this i think is very much it needs to be um so uh, um What's the word I'm looking for? It justified in the context of the institution that you that you work in. Uh, medical legal requirements and implications. I've added this here. I think it's incredibly important for this particular uh, type of, of of surgery. One of the biggest claims that was settled, at least in our country, was from a, a ventricular catheter that was. Um, misplaced in a child so defensive medicine i think is very much part of whether we like it or not how we practice uh, what i haven't touched on because i couldn't find too much about it but it's a reasonable question is the role of the type of ventricular catheter so the di diameter the design etc and things like that um thanks thanks now and i think that's that's me done i'm happy to take any questions oh fantastic uh, uh talk collection uh, lua and i think i think as you said uh, getting the catheter in the right place makes the rest of the life easy. Otherwise, you are 